Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have another great show for you tonight. Our guest is Jacob Waddell of the United States Hemp Building Association. He'll be talking about hempcrete and hemp wood and other things. So stay tuned for that. First, we have our hip news segment. And before that, we'll bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Okay, our first story tonight is from our nation's capital. President Joe Biden utilized his clemency powers for the first time last week. The White House announced the pardonings or commutation of sentencing for 78 people, most of whom had been on supervised release during the COVID pandemic. Of those 78 individuals, nine had federal marijuana charges. Branding thousands of our citizens as lifelong criminals because of a marijuana-related offense serves no legitimate societal purpose while granting clemency to nine individuals for federal marijuana offenses is the right thing to do. It's woefully inadequate when there remains over 10,000 individuals who still suffer under the weight of a federal charge on their criminal record. It's well past the time for President Biden to make good on his campaign promise to expunge the records of all federal marijuana offenders and prove that justice isn't a buzzword he uses to gain votes during election season. During the 2020 campaign, Joe Biden stated that, quote, no one should be in jail because of cannabis use, end quote, and pledged that as president he would, quote, decriminalize cannabis use and automatically expunge prior convictions, end quote. According to a recent poll compiled by YouGov.com, nearly 60% of Americans doubt the president intends to make any effort to advance marijuana-specific issues in 2022. Separate polling data provided by YouGov in December finds that 70% of U.S. adults support expunging marijuana-related convictions for nonviolent offenders. In a separate poll, a supermajority of Americans say that the use of marijuana should be made legal for adults, and most respondents agree that it's less harmful to health than drinking alcohol, according to the national survey data compiled by the market research firm SSRS. 69% of respondents, including 78% of Democrats, 74% of independents, and 54% of Republicans support legalization. When asked whether cannabis ought to be permitted for therapeutic purposes, support rises to an astounding 92%. Voters support legalizing marijuana regardless of political party affiliation. At a time when national politics remains acutely polarized, elected officials ought to come together in a bipartisan manner to repeal the failed policy of cannabis prohibition. It's one of the few policy reforms that voters on the left and the right can all agree on. 58% of respondents, including 71% of millennials, said that alcohol is more harmful to a person's health than marijuana. Only 4% of respondents perceive marijuana to be more harmful. Prior surveys have similarly reported that most Americans say that cannabis is far less harmful than either alcohol or tobacco. This poll possesses a margin of error of 3.5 percentage points. Full survey results are available online at SSRS's website. Our last story tonight is out of Canada. Most Canadians diagnosed with multiple sclerosis report using cannabis to mitigate their symptoms, according to data published in the journal Multiple Sclerosis and Related Disorders. The research is affiliated with the University of Alberta Department of Medicine, surveyed multiple sclerosis patients, frequency of cannabis use, and their motivations for consuming it. Canadian officials legalized the use of medical cannabis products nearly two decades ago. Uh, adult use sales were legalized in 2018. An oral spray containing precise ratios of plant-derived THC and CBD, known as Sativex, has also been available by prescription in Canada for treatment of MS since 2005. 
The authors reported that nearly two-thirds of respondents had consumed cannabis during their lifetimes and that 52% identified themselves as current users. Patients most frequently reported consuming cannabis to address symptoms related to sleep, pain, and spasticity. Respondents said that cannabis was moderately to highly effective at mitigating their symptoms. The majority of patients acknowledged learning about the therapeutic use of cannabis from someone other than their health care provider. Human trials indicate that the use of both whole plant cannabis and cannabis extracts can alleviate various symptoms of multiple sclerosis as well as potentially slow the progression of these diseases. The study, Medical Cannabis Use in Canadians with Multiple Sclerosis, appears in multiple sclerosis and related disorders. That's the end of our hemp news segment tonight. I just got to say it is very evil to deny people with multiple sclerosis and other diseases and neurodegenerative diseases to access cannabis. It can slow the progression of that terrible disease. But uh, back to our interview this evening. It's with Jacob Waddell of the United States Hemp Association. So stay tuned and help us restore hemp. I would like to introduce Jacob Waddell. You are in Tennessee, is that right, Jacob? Yep, Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee, country music, home of the world here. Um, and it's Willie Nelson's 89th birthday as we are recording this, though it will be playing a week from now. Uh, so it's a good day to be in Nashville, I guess. So you are with the United States Hemp Building Association. Did I say that right? Yep, that is correct. I am the uh, current executive director, as well as the executive director of the U.S. Hemp Building Foundation, which is its sister organization. I see, I see. So the foundation must be a 501c3? Correct. And the association, is that like a C5 or 6 or? Six. Yeah, C6. I never had a six. I had a three and four, C3 and C4. And in yeah. fact, uh, yeah, TFF. I mean, huh? Sorry. Yeah, I only know what a three, a four, and a six are. I don't know what the other ones are. Yeah, yeah, I think seven is uh, a trade association. Maybe that's what you are with six. Yeah, it's six. Yes, it covers a lot of different things. It's like trade associations, and it can also be things like soccer clubs and like, you know, sports or sports things. So it's basically just like a member based organization. I see. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, it, they have a few of them there. And for our viewers who don't know what we're talking about, that is the IRS tax code for nonprofit organizations. Only C3s get tax deductions, all the others have other hoops to ju jump through, but uh, have some sort of status with the uh, uh, Internal Revenue Service. So Jacob, tell me what the United States Hemp Association does and about the foundation and association. Cool, all right. So the USHBA is currently focused basically in three areas. One is codes. The other is standards for materials, and the third is, is educational material. Um, the, the, the reality is that the USHBA was set up in a very broad sense where we have a lot of different objectives and we're trying to cover a lot of different ground, which is really good because we need to cover a lot of ground. It just also at times um, kind of makes our mission a little bit here, a little bit there. Now, what we've been doing recently in the codes and area is we receive a recommendation for approval for the IRC submission we made. So that's for the International Residential Code. Now, this code is model building codes for the United States and some international or countries that also adopt it. This is a first step into then um, getting it adopted into different jurisdictions. Once the model is approved, then we do need that second step. There are certain states and jurisdictions which automatically adopt these appendices, um, but for the most part, we're going to need to do some work there. Um, the other, I guess, the significance of that is was a question that you had. Yeah. Uh, so, like the significance of this moving forward, one is that when we hopefully are going to try to get buildings permitted, especially if they're within the codes and what's written in the codes, we won't need an engineer involved and the permitting officer will be a lot more open to it, seeing that it exists in the code and there's rules 
for them to follow and for us to follow in order to approve the building. Um, hopefully this will also open the doors for things like home loans and, and other things that currently um, bodies that just aren't familiar with hemp building, because why would the banking system, why would insurance think about this stuff, would then see, oh, here's the certifying and controlling body in the market, the permitting offices saying this thing is a thing. Um, yes, of course you can get a home loan on this. So there, there's a lot of ripple effects as we get this approved and move forward. And so this is just a big step to open the doors to a lot of other things. I see. Um, so what has been happening to date with current hemp buildings? For our audience that doesn't know, I think the first hemp building was in Asheville, North Carolina. Is that right? Here in the United States. Yeah. First permitted, yes. Uh, there's there's definitely discussion that there was buildings before that. But um, yes, uh, Tim Callahan in Asheville, North Carolina got the first permit. And then actually there was, I think, a second building that got completed before their building. The push, it was like the Nah House and the Push House apparently got into a, a speed run or something. But, um, but yeah, so that was like 2009. And when, um, what did housing do then? What did they do about their permitting process? And e up till today, what have they done? Is it uh, like a special exemption to, to build a house with hemp fiber and hemp creek? So there's a rule in current codes that allows for the creation of new materials. It's called an alternative, alternative material variance. So basically if you are saying, I'm gonna use this material that's not in the codes in this building, I just have to prove that it will match or exceed the current requirements for existing products. The problem is that that is a whole proving ground and can take months and months to go through the processes and get approved. So it causes a delay in your building process. It's not in possibility, causes a delay. And depending on your permitting office might just be a complete, no, we're not moving forward with this. Cause there are certain jurisdictions that are very risk adverse and those we would not be allowed in at all in the current situation. Now the hope is with these model codes and if we get them adopted by the, that jurisdiction, it shouldn't be an issue at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then it'll just be part of everyone's standard building use material yes an option you know not not a requirement but <laughs> yeah so yeah. when uh that first building or buildings were built approximately in 2009 what kind and all of the ones built to date uh what kind of process did they go through did they have to wait many months or or can you say so um Certain jurisdictions um, have very lax or little to no permitting codes or permitting rules. You saw a lot of homes built in these jurisdictions or areas. Um, you also, I mean, for the most part, we can prove the material variance situation. We have, there's enough document, documentation and tests done. So eventually it seemed like most people were to overcome, were able to overcome any of these hurdles. And, and really once they realize that it's not just insulation that we're asking for. A lot of people were very open to it, um, but yes, they did have the delays. They did have to struggle through this whole process and convince people how that they could use this. And, um, but they did it and they did it because they, they cared about it and they wanted this to happen. And, you know, we are so thankful for those, those people that put in all that effort because that is kind of what we lean on today. We can point at those buildings. We can point at the success and be like, and explain to them that this is proven. This is a thing. We we we're not we're not asking you to go out on a limb here. We're just asking you to help us bring it into the mainstream. I actually grew up for five for five years from seventy five to eighty in Asheville, North Carolina, and first registered to vote in Buncombe County. So I have some some history there. I I haven't visited the Hemp House though, and so uh, uh, go ahead. I know, I know there's at least one, but there may be two hemp building Airbnbs in Asheville right now. Oh, all right. All right. And so, uh, well, the next time I go, I'll have to look those up for sure. How many different hemp buildings are there in America today? We're trying to get a good number on that. Uh, we have a spot on our 
website, ushba.org, that is a structures map, and we're trying to pull them up on there. No, we don't have them all. Um, you know, the estimates I've heard is somewhere between 60, and maybe 80. Um, but a lot of them are basically, it's, it's almost like a lot of independent activity. And, you know, that's, that's really what this organization is trying to do, is trying to tie all those pieces together. Because a lot of people have done a lot of good work around the country, and we just need to show them that this can be done anywhere. And, you know, there's the knowledge and know-how. So, um, yeah, I think the numbers, I think 60 and 80. But when we talk about overseas, we're talking about thousands and thousands. Um, Europe's been doing this for 30 years especially in France, they've really scaled it up and stepped it up, doing larger and larger buildings. UK has done a lot. Uh, Canada has done a lot. So we're just catching up, but. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that uh, French hemp is pulped into paper pulp in Spain, and it's shipped to three companies here in the United States that make cigarette paper. And that cigarette paper amounts to about 50% of tobacco rolling papers for the commercial uh, tobacco companies. So very few tobacco smokers realize that half the time they're smoking marijuana fiber with their tobacco. That's an interesting little side note there. Um, a friend of ours, mutual friend, Dion Margraf, who I first met in Uruguay back in 2016, he, uh, or no, it was 2014. He had, uh, I was trying to interview him about a year and a half ago and Unfortunately, he had a diabetic reaction and passed away unexpectedly at a very young age. I think he was in his 30s still at that time. But he had been telling me, I should interview you, Jacob Waddell, instead of him, and that you were better placed to talk about this. So I'm glad we finally got you on here, Jacob. And in memory of our good friend, Dion Margraf, uh, you're here now. And you're still pushing it. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, it is, that's very, I, I didn't, I, I hadn't heard that he had said that. And that, that means a lot to me. And that's, um, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. When he passed, it, it's, it was a big deal for our industry, big deal for our organization. Um, it was a, that was a giant loss. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to know how this organization would have been what it is today without having his drive and his passion. Um, yeah. But, I understand that using Hemp Creek, he built a hemp church in his yard in California. And little did I know, my mom moved less than a mile away from where that church is built here just last summer. And so I haven't been there to that church, but the next time I, I visit his mom, I, uh, I mean, my mom, I hope to go see him uh, or see that, but I know yeah. she's still suffering. I know she, she's had a hard life and, and lost both of her children. I've had several friends lost to diabetic comas. You know, the price of insulin is artificially inflated. It should be almost free, but the pet the, Pharmaceutical companies have uh, a huge profit margin that means thousands of people, good people like Dion and others uh, that are passed away because of their lack of ability to afford insulin or trying to ration insulin when they shouldn't have to do that because of the price. But that said, uh, I know Dion has been working in Mexico and throughout Europe and uh, South America in helping spread the word about in industrial hemp. So in the hemp buildings, that aside, in the hemp buildings, what we're talking about is insulation. Is that hempcrete? That is. Now there are plenty of other products and, and more being developed every day. Um, so a lot of our focus right now is, is on hempcrete. And that's because most of the other products coming to market have an analysis, analogous product in the market. So like for instance, there's hemp wood flooring, but it has Flooring already exists, so it just needs to be performing underneath the same standards as current flooring. I've got yeah. wood here. I've taken it around. I've given some of this away. I first saw this hemp wood flooring and hemp wood itself at the Southern Hemp Expo in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina last year. And I had Greg Wilson on the show, and 
he claims that the hemp wood is stronger than hick the, the lumber part is stronger than hickory and oak and therefore less scratch resistant for flooring materials but the the building materials themselves are incredibly strong uh can you address that um so okay so uh that was a real, so when you say building material strength, what building materials, because there are just so many, like, are you talking about hemp lime at that point? Are you talking about hemp wood or there, there's actually other ones I could go into? Tell um, me about the other ones mean? first. Okay, so, um, so of course, then you have like hemp bat insulation, which is the stuff, you know, comparable to like the pink stuff. And right now, hemp texture is trying to open that factory in Idaho or get that, I I think they broke ground or something. I just saw something. They also just got this <laughs> USDA um, approval for their their biological uh, matter. I think like you know eighty nine percent bio bio degree. I don't know. Sorry, I I don't have that in front of me. It's okay. But no, I said it's okay. Okay, yeah. So, um, but yeah, they're, so they're making great progress. I mean, even at this event. You know, somebody was showing, uh, so I was just at an event down in Florida. I was at the 850 Industrial Hemp Summit. And down there, just, uh, you know, I've been to a couple of these events around in different states. You know, it's up in one in North Dakota in December. Um, you know, I was in California for the World Ag Expo. I was out in, in North Carolina for the Industrial Hemp Summit there. And I was in Florida. And you can see in these different communities, like, the different ideas that are coming up and the different, um, you know, agricultural practices and, and hurdles that they're they're facing but while i was down there you could also see the innovators down there and this one guy had you know the osb board now this is something that a couple people have definitely produced over the years but we haven't had a constant regular supply of it right i had a friend david sieber and william condy who back in i guess the early 90s worked with the washington state the uh, wood sciences lab and made hemp fiber board that they claim was stronger than steel. I don't know about the stronger than steel part. I have yeah. theories on why they say that. I, I, from a material science side, I, I think it, it's, it's deflection to failure or something going on there. But um, uh -huh. but yes, there, there's a lot of potential, a lot of stuff. Um, I, I'm going to be real with, the, with the, the nerd side of me and the science side of me. There's like, yeah. like words. Uh, I need to see data because words can mean a lot of different things. Um, Unfortunately, David Sievers just passed away or so ago, but his hemp shield uh, varnish company is still there. And for anyone who needs uh, to to coat their their building materials with a varnish, uh, hemp shield's a, a good alternative. I think they're based in Eugene, Oregon. Absolutely, that that is one of the kind of older products. Like when we talk about hemp building, we think of the the you know, the wood or the actual physical stuff, but there are other things that are related to, to hemp building that like that, like it's, it's a varnish. Yes, seed and oil product made from seed yeah. oil. So that's um, incredibly useful and, 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 a, and a good replacement to things on the market. And that's really kind of the mindset we need from the innovators in our industry, in the hemp building industry. And it really using hemp in general is to try to find these alternatives to current things that are on the market that either we're extremely better than, or like we're replacing something that's harmful. And hemp can do a lot of those things. They can replace a lot of harmful materials and they do have some incredible properties from the oil to the fiber, to the herd. Um, so. So what do you know about the strength of this hemp wood product out there? Uh, I cannot say without looking at the data exactly. I, I spent, I, I know Greg, um, I trust Greg, so I don't think he's going to say anything that isn't true. Um, uh, so uh, when, like, for instance, when you say hardness, um, right, you say strength, I think you might be meaning hardness. So hardness is, would be the scratch resistance because it's like the impact and how much it's going to dent in. And from my understanding, yes, it's hardness is like in the range of hard wood um you know strength can mean different things but um i absolutely believe that when he talks about the timber stuff i've never seen those loaded i would love to see like 
So like put a, put a load on it to see it fracture. I would like to see that process just because I've seen, you know, I've run that type of equipment before. I've seen those, those failures and um, seeing a failure can tell you a lot about the material. And I've just never seen one of these things fail. So uh, I think that would be interesting, but if he has ta test data, um, I'm sure it's true. Um, you probably, yeah, there's, there's other strange properties. I think the electrical property is the strangest one about the hemp wood. Did, did you talk about that at all? No, I don't know about that at all. Okay, so there's electrical properties that hemp wood because they, they when they they um, in, they compress the material, they leave the fiber in there, and thus the fiber can create a chain from one side of the wood to the other that acts like a conductor uh -huh. and creates like a a relative like relatively range of a current, and so it sounds like when it deflects the stretching and compressing of those fibers is creating a piezoelectric effect and you can actually measure the difference. So there's theories and like, there's been discussions about trying to use that for sensors. Um, but that's just like an added benefit of hemp wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. I have heard recently that uh, some speculation on the internet, you know, there's not much, uh, veracity and a lot of those uh, things you see out on the internet they're talking about using hemp as a replacement for rebar in, in cement construction have you heard anything about that yes um i've seen a couple well i've spoken to a couple people uh working on this i've seen one version myself um you know it's uh the 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 point of rebar when you deal with concrete um little material science thing here um concrete cement uh is really really good in compression it's really really bad in tension so you know you could just load it up with weight all day long and it'll be fine problem is that when you build like a bridge or a surface like this when you have compression on this side you start getting tension on the bottom and thus that would be where you would fracture and fail. So you put rebar in there because rebar and steel is really good in tension. And so it holds the tension in when it compresses out. And then when it's compressing in the, the concrete's dealing with it. So you need something that will interface with the concrete and make a good enough bond in order that it moves together and stays together. Um, and then just has that, that tensile strength. Uh, it's, what I've seen, the sample I've seen, would work. Uh, the, I think the question with that product, like many products, is theoretically it's there, where's the price point hit, and how do you scale it up? But it, like what they're, what they're making is like a, a it's a, basically a, a hemp polymer type blend. Um, and so it become, it's, it's like almost having like a polymer stick, if you will, because when you deal with, chemistry and materials, you really drop into three different groups, metals, ceramics, and then polymers. And then when you look at biological systems, you know, of course, ceramics or any type of stone, metal is like ore, but polymers, biologically speaking, is like any natural carbon-based material. They're all bunches of chains. So cellulose, you know, skin, all these things, you know, uh, proteins, all these are shorter, different lengths of carbon chains. And that's all a polymer is, is an extremely long carbon chain. So yes, it's doable. I've seen it. I, I think it makes sense. It's just gonna come down to price comparison and scaling it up. Like how do they take it from a, a bench to a manufacturing? Availability. You know, there's a lot of talk about him replacing a lot of things. Steel in uh, concrete buildings. Hip uh crete itself is very similar to that how does hempcrete compare to concrete concrete okay so, you know sand and uh other materials how does it compare in terms of strength and and uh ease of building okay so these are very different systems um you know yeah other than the name actually it's the, the name <laughs> there's two reasons why they're very similar well a couple of reasons um, one is obviously the name, um, and the others I will explain right now. Talking about the base material for hempcrete, the 
matrix composite is based on lime and then something else to help it react with water. Concrete is Portland cement or a different type of cement usually. Now, to get lime and cement, you start with limestone. You cook to a certain degrees to get rid of the CO2 out of what should, calcium carbonate down to calcium oxide. This gets to lime. So this is the first step, even for cement. Then with cement, you heat it up more, you add some chemicals, and then it creates a different structure and chemical composition, um, and that's cement. Lime reacts with CO2 like from the air and is reabsorbing, trying to get back to its stable state of the calcium carbonate. Now, with the chemical modification you made to cement, it reacts with water. These differences in reactions cause different properties. So cement, because it reacts with water and will tightly bond, creates a stronger material that can bear, carry a heavy load is in way, many ways a miracle of modern science, but it also, of course, has a lot of downsides. Um, the energy that goes into it, you know, it's, it's wasteful nature. It's, it's consumption of water even can be seen as a major problem in long term. Um, and then you have lime, which has a slower, less tightly bound process, but it's vapor permeable. Um, it, it can, you know, easily absorb and release water. Um, it can continue to grow in a way. So when you, when I've been thinking about this, this actually came into my head yesterday, was carbonization um, and calcification of materials when they're in hemp lime is basically like converting other materials into limestone um, in a way. And that is a continuing process that's active with lime. And I'm not sure that's active when you deal with cement. All that jibber jabber aside, um, the, the reality is that cement creates a very strong load bearing material. Lime does not. Lime creates a very vapor open material, which is important for the hemp uh, lime interaction, but it's not going to bury a load as the binder currently exists. Uh, this kind of gets the, the whole term hemp creep. Um, hempcrete, technically speaking, in Latin, what that's saying is hemp aggregate. Like concrete is with aggregate, technically speaking. Um, so that doesn't define the binder that's involved in it. The binders can vary greatly. Currently, what we think of as hempcrete is hemp lime. Yeah. It's using lime based binders. There's so much research right now on other binders that technically, like, Simplistically, it would be clay, but more complex would be like geopolymers, or more even complex than that are things that we don't even have words for that are a mixture of chemicals that are doing this or that. Could have gypsum in it or magnesium oxide. Now there's pros and cons to these, like those two in particular have water retention issues. Like they, they retain water rather than easily absorbing and releasing water. Um, this causes moisture to stay in contact with the organic material of hemp and can cause issues like mold development potentially. Um, so there's a lot of research and work to be done there. And as that advances and the understandings advance on different materials, it will evolve. Uh, hemp lime, as we currently know it, is an insulative material. So concrete, because it's tightly bound and strong, high density, it transfers thermal uh, pretty openly. So it doesn't have a high R value because of the openness of the hemp lime and the air that is existing in the hemp as well as in the lime open system, it has a higher R value. And that is why it's useful in insulation. I think that got everything, but. Well, good. It was a little oh. bit of a hit there, but that's okay. Um, so how did you first become involved in hemp? What drew you to being the executive director of the United States Hemp Building Association and separate foundation. Um, so without going to my whole life story, um, Go the, into life story, we still got 30 minutes here, Jacob. OK, OK, I'm a, I'll tell you my story. So I, I was born in Texas to Army parents. 
They went from Texas, Germany to Texas, retired, went to South Florida where my dad was born. Um, went up to the University of Florida, got a material science and engineering degree. Um, went from there up to Georgia Tech, was, um, got a master's there working in material science and engineering, focused on composites. And I, that kind of really expanded my understanding of the interface between different materials, specifically ceramics and polymers. Um, then I went to their testing lab, went traveled, got a one-way ticket, went traveling around Europe for a while, came back, decided to try to be a musician. Then I uh, was tired of being poor, got, got, went back to engineering. Um, working in engineering, I was working, I first started in the marine industry, making fuel tanks for boats. Then I worked in the automotive industry and kind of moved my way up there. And I, I saw what was happening around me. I, I was working in an industry I didn't enjoy. I was working 60 hours a week and like just not like using up my energy and my life in something I didn't believe in. And so I started looking for something that I could live for and actually find fulfillment in. Um, got my MBA while I was doing this. So I was like, okay, new skills. How do I apply these? And I went hunting for what, something what I could do to really help the world. What year did you get your MBA? Uh, I would have to go to the other room to look. I want to say, okay, so I think it was 03 for the bachelor's, 05 for the, uh, I'm going to guess 12 or 13. I'd actually have to go see the diploma. I got it from Tennessee Tech. I did it while I was working. Um, man, I guess it would have been like six years ago, probably. Anyway. Okay. I don't, I'm I don't sorry. I'm sorry. time completely. Um, uh, yeah. So then I was trying to find something, started doing my research. I came across this material and it was like, I'm a material scientist. Here's a material that hasn't been fully developed in like 70 years. Um, I could have a lot of fun with this and it could have an extreme impact in the world around us because this is taking us to a like positive impact material on the world which is so difficult to find because almost everything we do as humans consumes things. And this is an example where we could actually try to draw some of that back and like try to trap some of that carbon that we're constantly emitting. So saw a lot of big positive uptake to it, uh, not to mention the health benefits and the potential of creating an industry from like the ground up and trying to do it the right way. And then I met some people. I met Eric uh, McKee and uh, kind of got brought into the U.S. Hemp Building Association and then was like, I have all these skills from this automotive corporate world that I worked in and, and was doing well in. And now let's try to use those here. And I started working for the organization. Well, with the organization, can you tell us about your duties and the goals and work of the organization? Absolutely. So, um, you know, we're it's kind of like a startup still. So there's a lot of things we're figuring out. People are wearing a lot of hats, a lot of evolution of the organization. Um, right now, uh, the previously, the IRC was a main focus. That was about six months of the main target. The, ne the next thing I'm working on looks like it's going to be um, and best I, practices. The IRC, just for our audience who don't know, you want to tell yeah. us exactly what went on with the IRC? I mean, you mentioned it earlier, but uh, yeah, what does IRC stand for? So it's International Residential Code. It's a model building codes for residential buildings in the United States and um, other international com companies that adopt it. Um, so for us to get in, um, just kind of opens the door for residential building. Uh, the process basically is you have to write a document that matches the formatting of, you know, the, the rest of the code and has the information. So for us, we had to specify things that were modifications to the current code. Uh, for instance, like a weather barrier. Uh, when you deal with hemp line, you want to have a vapor open system. Now, current codes require a weather barrier or something that is a vapor closed system. So you basically covering yourself in plat, you're covering a building in plastic and that's preventing vapor from entering. Well, that's, we, we can't have that. So we had to write the code and specifically state no weather barrier. 
and you know other things like that where we had to put in details of the material for them to analyze and check and then we had to put in any exceptions that we needed from the current code to be utilized with this material um, so we drew that up it was about a six month process we got most of our funding around the time of the, the last hemp build um some uh the hemp build 2021 which was a ushbf uh virtual event uh, we have another one actually coming up uh ushbf uh, hemp build 2022 in July 9th, I think is the day that we haven't officially announced it, but there's a little sneak preview. Um, and that will hopefully gather enough money for our efforts this year, or at least some of the money. Um, uh, can't thank our, our sponsors enough or the people that donated to us enough, um, for helping us. But yeah, so the IRC again, as discussed earlier, will hopefully move us forward in many ways. Um, and was a previous focus. The next focus looks like it's going to be what right now is called best practices, because that's what we've kind of always called it. But it looks like it's going to be a series of educational output, uh, focusing and kind of using the IRC submission as a template and going down it and explaining some different details. Um, you know, talking about the hemp herd in specific, like in detail, talking about why it matters, what matters about it, what it is, talking about the binder in some detail, and then going into some more uh, complex conversations like application and structure so that we can help, for one, educate the public, to educate the building professionals. Um, there's going to be building professionals that may be running into this for the first time and are just like, what does this even mean? And then they could see some of these videos or short outputs and get some of that information. And then the hope is to have short outputs and then long outputs and long output will probably be a large written document that really goes into some detail on these different aspects. And that will be something that hopefully will later be usable for courses. And again, for business professionals or building professionals that really need to know the details and know the ins and outs of it and people looking to get into this area and actually use this material. Um, there's a lot of knowledge out there that's been gained, but Honestly, it's probably existing between thousands of people when we're talking about a world of billions. So we need to get it out there. We need to get it in to records. And do you have a plan on, on you must have a plan in terms of uh, doing that? Yes. So the luckily one of the outputs uh, or one of the consequences of the building code submission was we had to interact or we did interact with an international community to try to get it reviewed and discussed and you know get everyone's insight on it. Um, we're hoping that we can use that similar network as well as you know our internal knowledge and other people that we have in our organization to help inform this material and get it to be as good as possible. We, we are right now and we're clicking in the last pieces, but we're looking at having a production team and then having an advisory team to look over all content and then having um, specific topics uh, inputted by specialists in those areas. Uh, there are certain areas like finishes, but there's specific people that are just really knowledgeable on it, like Anthony Noron from uh, Duchamp in, Fran or in Canada. Sorry, he's French Canadian, but he's, he is in Canada. <laughs> Um, you know, it'll be someone like him who could really help inform that section and, and make sure that we got all our details right and talk about the benefits of Lime potentially over other uh, materials because Lime is, of course, fantastic. Matching the binder and the finish helps bonding and some other things. So, um, I have yeah. seen a uh, small community that our common friend Stephen Clark had outside of, of Mexico City where they put coconut on the exterior and lime and they polished the lime till it had a, a mirror surface. And it was incredible for artwork and, and other things. Yeah, I need to get a hold of Stephen Clark. So do you have a contact with him by any chance that yeah. you can share with me? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think you're talking about Tadillac and that is, yeah an incredible art. Um, I've been lucky, um, I'm blocking on his name right now, and I, I, I'm sorry about that, but there's this uh, Lime professional, um, I wanna say it's Lime Works, 
see the line works the line strong and i do apologize about that because i like both companies but um uh, you know that that are experts and i was in a training course with um with them in idaho and saw the you know the, the rubbing it in and making it all shiny and making that beautiful gloss finish and like when you talk about the potential of these i'm gonna call them old world finishes um the beauty in them that it, it it's beautiful it was almost like glass yeah and it's like uh just imagine that coming into your house like we're not we're not you know you suddenly just have beautiful walls that you don't want to paint them. You know, you don't want to cover these things up. You, you want them to live. Um, absolutely. Yeah, it was pretty amazing place there. I was watching him put them out of Hemp Creek buildings in Mexico. He still does that, mostly out of the Yucatan Peninsula. But uh, I think you and he and me will be meeting again if not before in thailand in uh, uh late uh uh set uh, late november early early december for the second international hemp environmental forum i was blessed to be invited and went to the first international hemp environmental forum in kyoto japan back in july of 2016 Definitely one of the biggest events in my life. And I'm excited to see that Takashi in Japan is working with Olivia and a group of other people there in Thailand to put together a second event. And so uh, when when you had reached out to Sergi at the start of the Ukrainian war there, uh, Takashi said, introduce me to Jacob Hotel. And even though we hardly knew each other, I, I made that introduction. and. Uh, I see now that you are, are going too. I'm excited about that. Yeah, and I do appreciate that introduction. I've never been to Thailand. I've only been, the only place I've been to over there is Japan. So I'm excited. I'm actually thinking I'm going to take a couple weeks off around the event. So yeah. that I can get over there and then just check out Thailand. Because uh, it's a, I hear an incredibly beautiful country with amazing people. And um, yeah, I, I'm very excited about that event. I still got to finalize my plans and make sure I have my life together to disappear for a little bit. But um, yes, it's, it's very exciting, very exciting stuff. It's it's great to see the international community come together. Cause I mean, it, this is a very, hemp in general is a, a, a weird conversation. Yet you wanna have the international touch and understanding so we can all learn from each other. But ideally in the end, it's a local product. Um, you know, most situations, the, the hope is to get the greatest environmental impact that we're talking about local communities doing this. You know, we're, we're not transporting things halfway across the world because we can grow this plant anywhere and we can thus make most of these things almost anywhere. Um, but it's, it's great to see the communication. And I, I say from my own experience, uh, working with builders in Europe and in the UK, um, in, in Ireland, in, Canada in Australia, you know, it's it's we it's sharing of information that will get us to move faster and make this an internationally important and significant commodity, which it will be someday. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. I've only I spent three days in Thailand back in oh, it must have been um, nineteen eighty. Eight, and uh, I was in southern China attending school there, learning about Chinese culture, so I could import him paper and fabric. And uh, uh, I was wanting to go to Hong Kong, but I got on a an unlisted flight to Bangkok, kind of by surprise, so I could get to Hong Kong. I only spent three days there, but the you got to see the Grand Palace there, man. It's one of the wonders of the world. But uh, that aside, I look forward to seeing you there, if not before. Uh, what about the future of the Hemp uh, Building Association and the, what what do you foresee in the near future now that you've gotten past this uh, IRC code edition? Is there uh, more work to do on that? And what's uh, what are your projects in the near future? Yeah, there's so much work to get done. Um, and we're lucky we, we just had a new board come in in February with a whole bunch of new energy and and um, activity 
as well as we've just had some a couple interns come on and we, we have we, we see the organization growing and building we have a course that that event I mentioned earlier the, the team working on that and then we have um, test procedures that we're talking about trying to standardize so that we can send them out to different universities that can test builds and we can start getting some solid data on performance in different like different areas and we have uh, LCA analysis discussions occurring right now um, which is has to do with what they stand for so LCA has to do basically carbon footprint so when you talk about carbon well carbon footprint if you just talk about carbon impact to the world how you calculate calculate that is significant especially when we talk about carbon credits and stuff um, and long story short the carbon that is sucked into the plant during growth is called biogenic carbon current rules do not include that in your calculations because almost none of the materials that they've talked about or think about are natural the only exception would be wood and woods come up with its own calculator but it's like trying to get that calculator designated like this is how you calculate these are your inputs you need to figure out um, on the building side um, and so that we're looking at that um, got a group supply chain groups working on herd specifications right now so that we can start communicating basically run these tests these test results will answer these questions for the person buying and the person selling can provide this you know simple thing like that but it's something that's established in europe they don't have designated test standards to repeat it here so in the united states we've been struggling to prove out what the quality of material is and that we think is the reason that we've been below par on quality currently most product that is used for hemp building is imported but we think if we can get these standards put into place and say this is how you test it processors will know what tests are on they'll know what their test results are and they'll prove up to the level they need to be at to be competitive in the market and really sell to us um so we got that going on that going on the best practices i already talked about uh, regional leaders are trying to establish and improve like our regional hubs because again this is kind of a localized market you know you deal with let's say let's look at on the farming side or what they're what they're doing and why aren't they the same that has to deal with the standards connection and that that's that's a whole nother you know can of worms that is beyond the scope of the permitting office so um so we need to get those done. We need to get structural analysis done. There's been some really good theses on how that will perform, but we need actual data in order to, for instance, try to decrease lumber from 16 on center to 24 on center. We need to prove that we improve the structural stability of that building enough to allow us to separate those studs and use less lumber in our construction, which empirically, you know, what we have data-wise is like obvious, um, you know, it's, it's hempcrete compared to air or a bat insulation is going to give you more structural stability. When you talk about your framing member, if there's stuff packed on every side of it, it can't deflect. And when it deflects is when it will fail. So that should, that's bracing and it's helping to brace the material. So we need to prove out these things with their required tests in order to get them to accept what we already know. Um, yeah, so that's some of the stuff. There's so many things. There are, um, there are. You're you're a busy man. That's for certain. Well, at the, I couldn't do all these things. All the only reason we're able to do all these things is we have a busy team. Right. And uh, can't be more thankful for that. You want to tell us about the rest of your team briefly? Absolutely. So um, with the board members that that just came on. Well, uh, let's just start with the the ones that were coming on from last time with Sergey. So Sergey is uh, one of our board members. Um, Sergey Lakukov uh, in, in Ukraine. He's been, I met him at that Japan conference back in 2016 as well. And he's been building a lot of materials there and got his family out of the Ukraine. Is he, do you know? No, he's uh, currently, I believe, in Portugal. Um, you know, it's, the war's not over. And uh, he's trying to figure out. How to, yeah, say it again. I said it could be going on for a long time. Yeah, hopefully that's, that's the reality. Evolve into a nuclear war, but that's another topic. Yeah, well, we're we're very happy he's safe, yeah. um, and very proud. He's 
Um, one of the founding board members of the USHBA. Um, he's the only one that's still with the board right now. Um, and he's the head of the education group. Of course, a wealth of, of knowledge, uh, having built around the world um, and been doing this for a very long time. So um, he's one of our, he's one of the board members. Uh, we also have Rachel Berry, who's a regional leaders um, director. She is also the president of the Illinois Hemp Growers Association. She's very heavily involved in the, the hemp industry in many ways. She's you know, a farmer. She, she really um, has a lot of regional knowledge. She's great for that. And, uh, and I, if you don't know her, you should know her. And she's, she's a great human being. We have Alona Thompson. Alona Thompson is the events and marketing director. She was um, our previous uh, staff member. Uh, I guess at the time it's called executive assistant and she helped me so much last year. Uh, really at times I, there are certain things that wouldn't have gotten done without her at all. Uh, I may not have kept my sanity. I may have crumbled. I don't think the IRC would have happened without her because if I had to focus on all the stuff she was covering, I wouldn't have been able to focus on the IRC. Um, so, so thankful for her. And, um, then we have communications director, Heather Fazio down in, in Texas she is an incredibly hard worker and she's helping to like really advance us very quickly on how we communicate internally, um, newsletter, things like this. Uh, we have Marilyn Hill um, down in Colorado. She's our fundraising director. She's working right now on getting you know, all the things to make sense in, um, so that we can start really going aggressively after grants. Henry Gage Jr. is our certifications director. He's working on that testing stuff that I was talking about and so much more. He has some great plans for New York and we're talking about rolling those out, like making a blueprint to roll out in other states. Um, and then Ryan um, Doherty is our supply chain director. He's the one that's working on the herd specifications right now and rolling that out. Um, and I think I, I think I got everybody. I feel okay. like I got everybody, and if I didn't, I apologize, and I'm sure I'll hear I did wonderfully. Yeah, thank you. So if somebody wants to reach out to the United States Hemp Building Association and get involved, what's the best way to do that? So ushba.org, you can come find out about us, um, and uh, if you want to talk to somebody, uh, you can either email uh, info at ushba.org or you can email me at jacob at ushba.org. Um, the info goes to Alona right now and Jacob goes to me. Um, so that, that's the best way. Uh, also consider uh, all this stuff does take money. Um, and if you want to donate, consider donating to USHBF, uh, ushbf.org. You'll, you'll find a link and I'll link you to the page on the USHBA site, or you can just go to our main page and you'll see a button there to donate. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. We've had Jacob Waddell in Nashville, Tennessee with the United States Hemp Building Association and Affiliated Foundation. Uh, I want to thank you for your work. I am just amazed to see the progress your team has made. And uh, I encourage our viewers to reach out and learn how to incorporate hemp into their building materials if they're so fortunate as to be able to, to use this material. Thank you, Jacob, and continue to work to restore him. Thank you. Thank you so much.